Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So we are pleased to welcome today Peter Triantafilou from University of Patras. I've known Peter for quite some time. I'm not going to say exactly how long. <laughs> <laughs> what do I want to say? No, no. So Peter has been, now been at University of Patras for about 10 years, and he was at the Technical University of Crete before that, and before that, Simon Fraser. Right. And before that, University of Waterloo. Right. Uh, Peter has worked on a lot of things uh, during his career, but mostly I would say it's been things that involve distributed systems and data management, file storage, that kind of stuff, managing data in a distributed context in various ways, no, plus other things. So today he's going to talk about how to extract more value out of key value stores. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here and present some of the stuff we've been working on the last year. Uh, when I say we, uh, I shouldn't forget to mention my uh, colleagues. Nikos Darmos is uh, a former PhD student of mine, and uh, Ioannis and George are basically uh, master's students working with me at the University of Patras. So the title of the talk is, is a bit iffy towards complex queries on Q-value stores. So what we'll try to do is uh, first, I'm going to present the overall framework, what the philosophy is behind what we're trying to do and what that shapes our approach, and then go uh, into a bit of more length into two particular types of queries that I think are interesting and see how we can process them efficiently over key value stores on the cloud. And I will end the talk using uh, presenting four or five slides referring to the major conclusions and the things that are interesting that we think we've learned from this on top of another solution that's good for this particular type of query and it's fast and so on and so forth. So the general framework is that uh, we're talking about data management services on the cloud and uh, data accesses come in in the form of uh, 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 queries of various complexities and we typically have this well-known trade-off between storage costs and query processing times. And the idea here is that we would be willing to pay a bit more in terms of storage costs if that could uh, save us money in the long run. And talking about money, we uh, think that the value to the enterprise will come from query execution. So the more queries, the better, the more money would be made. And so the idea would be uh, that either the provider or the client uh, comes up with uh, smart ways to invest in storage, to build up interesting uh, indices that will help them expedite the query processing. Um, a few things about the overall driving philosophy of the work is we want to do uh, some work towards real-time queries on the cloud. Um, the state of the art falls short of this. Uh, we've seen the last four or five years uh, papers published in the major database conferences trying to do queries such as joins and other things that are basically are use MapReduce in one way or the other um, to, to accomplish the task. A cute way to describe the talk would be no MapReduce for no SQL query processing. Uh, I don't quite believe that, but towards the end I will mention what I mean by that and to what extent I believe that. So the idea is, the basic driving philosophy is we don't want to do map reduce, we want to build indices. So the question is how to build indices. And we want to build the right indices and the key design, uh, one of the key design decisions for us is to have simplicity. Simplicity in the design of the, of the index, simplicity in the way that you process the index to come up with the answer to the query. And, of course, we always realize that what we're going to do is going to be plugged into a big system. There's a lot of smart folks out there that are coming up with valuable things in terms of infrastructure, so we can use that. We can basically piggyback on that in order to come up with a better system. And, of course, efficiency and scalability always play a big role, and I'll describe, we'll talk, I'll talk about that later in, in more detail. So the first part is a bit more 
uh, details about interval indexing and querying. So there's a bunch of different applications out there. Uh, I mentioned a few here that basically refer to temporal queries uh, or interval queries in general, uh, whether it refers to time or not, independently of that. So there are different types of, query, of, of queries out there. We can call, I call them intersection queries, such as uh, in a web archiving system, I'm interested to find out pages that started or finished within a particular time interval for some analytics reason. Or I'm looking for events that are completely contained uh, the events span a specific time interval, this time interval is completely contained within another time interval. Or I'm looking for uh, a security event, say we have a terrorist attack in Akon Wood, which spans over five hours, and I'm looking to find as to what interesting went on in a week before the, the start, uh, including a week end after the start. So these are what I call them uh, containing queries. In general, the query types look like this. So we have an interval, uh, a begin and end time point. So the first part, are the sort of con containment queries, the contained queries. It's obvious what it means. These are uh, the contained queries are these green, uh, does it show? Yeah, it's over there. Uh, the green intervals. Uh, the intersection queries are basic queries that are crossing the query interval either from the left or from the right. Those are the purple uh, intervals. And a particular type uh, of interesting queries is called, so called the stabbing query, where uh, you basically have a single point where the beginning and end time points are the same, and you want to find out this particular time point, which are the intervals that are being crossed by it. So what we will be doing is we're trying to come up with uh, indices and query processing algorithms using these indices to expedite answers to these queries. So we're talking the, the basic infrastructure that we're assuming are key value cloud stores, its bases are reference, uh, the basic idea here, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, is we have an H-based master. These are basically tables or parts of tables, if you wish. And all of these are, are data nodes, which are called region servers in, in, in H-based lingo. And inside one of these, there is a mem store. Uh, these key value stores are optimized for high write throughput, so all writes go into memory. And eventually, they're being sorted into these particular file formats with particular indices, and then they're dumped into the, the Hadoop distributed file system underneath. So this is the, the general systems infrastructure of what we're going to be working with. So the first question is, OK, so we want to support now these uh, interval queries. Is there any native support provided by HSpace to do this? So here I have an example. I will be using a running example through this, which is uh, a web archiving uh, scenario. This is most of our data comes. This is where most of our data comes from. And this is actually what's paying for this, for this research, because this is a big European project in the terms of about 4 million euros over three years. Uh, it's basically four partners throughout Europe. And uh, Patras is in charge of basically coming up with the indexing part and the query processing part on these indices for that. So here I'm having a, a region server, a data node, uh, storing different regions or tables. Uh, the row key could be the URL of the, of the site or whatever. There is a whole bunch of other things that we don't care about for the purpose of this talk. And we're also having a begin and an end period. This could be whatever. This could be representing different crawling times where this thing was alive. Every time you get a new crawl of the same page, basically a new timestamp starts. And when the same page is crawled again, it's changed. Then that's when the interval ends, and so on and so forth. But in general, we have a begin and an end uh, time point associated with every, uh, with every row key. And the row key here is a URL. Okay. And similarly here, so if I have a query that comes into the system that basically says, uh, give me all the interesting things that happen in this time period, then if you look into the times, you'll see that it hits on both of these region servers. And what can Edge Space do with this? It can basically, you can run a filter. You can do a get operation specifying a filter. And basically, the filter is a predicate that basically says, when you grab a row, look at the beginning and time intervals to see if they're interesting with respect to this query interval. OK, pretty simple stuff, nothing great. The, the bad thing here is that obviously this is inefficient and costly. Why? Because it grabs every single row. It applies a predicate. If it's OK, it keeps it. Otherwise, it not. It goes on and on for all the region servers in parallel, but still, it has to touch all the rows. And especially for queries for low selectivity. Selectivity is an issue here. Uh, I'll touch on that later. And we have quite a few of those 
low selectivity queries. So the question is, can we expect like this? OK, so there's a couple of ideas here that are, that are at play. The first idea is what we call a time point, uh, an endpoint index. So here's my raw data. Again, I have a raw key, which could be the URL or whatever. It's how it is, it's stored in HSpace. And I have a begin and an end point for each one of those different row keys. OK, it could be other data here. We don't care about it. That's why I'm not showing it. So what we're doing basically is we're coming up with uh, an additional table, if you wish, a column family. Uh, so we grab every row. This is done using MapReduce processes in parallel. And what we're doing is for every different endpoint that we see, we create a new row. And the key here is this particular value. Right? So there is a row now in my table with value 1-1-2010, one one whatever. Okay? And also in this other column family that I've created here, I'm putting in the, the corresponding endpoint. Okay? Similarly, I'll grab this, the endpoint, I will create a new row for this. And in the other column family, I'll put the left endpoint of the interval. Okay? Pretty simple stuff. So I will keep grabbing all the rows, creating all these uh, uh, new rows. And this will basically serve as my index. This segment of the table is the, the index for answering uh, interval queries on my raw data set. So let me give you an example of this. So this is my index that I've built over the previous example. And suppose I have an interval query that comes in that basically says, I'm interested in this time interval. Tell me what's interesting in there. OK? So there is a couple of things going on here underneath. First thing is, by design, HSpace can do really quickly scans, scans of rows. So by placing everything by row ID here, I can really identify segments of interest really quickly and get all the rows really quickly, riding on what HSpace provides me already. OK, so if I look at the, at the endpoints of this uh, interval in the query, then this basically gives me a segment of my endpoints index. And the idea here is, well, looking at the results, for example, I see there's different things going on here. For example, I see there is this item B that both starts and finishes within the segment of the index. There is this item A that's basically it's a crossing query, a crossing interval from the left because it started out over, over there and it finishes in here. There is also this thing C that started before and it finishes within this query interval. And there's a couple of things that start within this particular segment and finish outside of it. OK? So the result set that I get from looking in here is A, B, C, and F. I don't get D, and D is also part of the result in the sense that if you're interested in the containment queries. Okay. So in order to get D as well, I will have to look either onto this side or onto this side. The idea would be by scanning my index from the beginning of time till the end of the segment, specifying the query, I would be able to get all the interesting things that happen in it. Or similarly, by scanning my index from the beginning of the, of the, inter of the query interval, to the end of my index, I will also be able to get everything. And I would rely on the fast scan operator of HSpace or any key value store to provide me with the answers. Note that for a particular type of query, like the crossing queries from left and right, or the queries that are completely, uh, intervals that are completely contained in the query interval, then this thing is really fast. Typically, it's a, it gives me a small index of uh, a small section of my endpoints index, and I can get all the relevant data pretty fast. If I have to do a stabbing query, then I would probably have to scan huge portions of this. And this is going to be huge. Okay, so that's the take home message from here. So we've come up uh, as a second help for this. We've come, we looked into the literature as to what are uh, data structures, and there is a lot of data structures here, indexing methods to, uh, to, be, to be using for. Uh, for interval queries. So we selected one that's one of the prototypical uh, segments for doing this, and it's called the segment tree. And what we've done is we have provided a key value coding, a key value representation of the segment tree on the table. And we're using MapReduce faces, which are actually optimized in ways that I hope I'll have time uh, to point out in order to create, based on the raw data table that's given to us, stored somewhere in HSpace, uh, run these MapReduce uh, processes and come up with the key value representation of, of the segment tree, which we call this MRST thing. So uh, in terms of computing the elementary intervals, 
which are needed in order to process the, the segment three queries. It's pretty much, it's, it's, not, it's not particularly difficult. So what we do is we're splitting the space and we're giving uh, these data items to, to two different mappers in this example. These mappers are basically producing all the different endpoints in the, in the beginning and end times. And the, some shuffling is going on here, so everything is sorted. And in the end, what comes out is what we're storing to edge space is once we've stored all the endpoints, these are basically the elementary intervals. And based on that, we have a, a second, oh, by the way, here we also have realized that we, need, we have all the data that we need to build the endpoints index, so we build the endpoints index as well in terms of writing it as a separate table uh, in edge space. So now that we have the elementary intervals, it's, uh, that we fit them into a second phase in, in our MapReduce processes in the different mappers, and each mapper basically will create uh, its own uh, binary tree on top of the, of the basic atomic or, or elementary intervals. Again, this is, uh, this is not particularly difficult and then we join all these different uh, separate subtrees being produced under one heading, under one common root. To give you an idea of what it looks like, uh, this is what the, the, the MRST index looks like in eight space. So let's go through it. So what we've done is we have this coding of the tree in a table and we basically faithfully follow the standard algorithms for using a segment tree in order to answer uh, interval queries. So suppose we have a query that gives us, this is a stabbing query of this point. We know what the root of the tree is, and the, the root is here on this table. This table basically stores a row key, and the row key is what is the time point with which every particular node in the tree is identified. So when you build a segment tree, every node in the tree is identified with a specific time point. For the root, this time point is basically the median of all the endpoints, if, if they're sorted. Okay? For every subtree, the root of the subtree is uh, the, uh, the median of all the endpoints covered by that subtree. That's the basic idea. And also, for every uh, node in the tree, we have uh, every node in the tree is associated with, uh, as, with an interval. And the interval is basically the union of the intervals associated with their children, with the node's children. And this is defensively uh, defined. And so we have these two pieces of items. The row key is this unique time point. And then we basically have other information. Every node in my segment tree uh, can have a list of different uh, intervals that are placed on that node. So we have that. And we also have pointers to the right and left child of every node. Okay, note here, in terms of traditional index pointers, these pointers are just keys, different keys into my table. Okay. So when this query comes in, I'm comparing uh, this date here with this date. It falls to the right of it. First of all, I will grab whatever is in that node. That's a unique characteristic of, of segment trees that to answer a stubbing query, what I will basically do is follow a root from the root of the tree to a, to a particular leaf. And all the, no, and all the uh, segments that I see stored on these nodes, I will collect them. They're all part, they're guaranteed to be part of the result. Okay. So I will compare this date here with this date, and I will decide whether to go left or right. This date here falls to the right of this, so I will go to the right side. First, I will grab the item stored there, and I will keep it from my result list. And then I will grab the right child, and then basically uh, sends me over to this row, and I will do exactly the same thing. Compare this with that. And this falls to the left child. There is nothing to grab there, so there's nothing stored there. So then I would go to this, and I will keep continuing this, this, the same process. So this actually uh, has this node, has this particular interval stored there. So I will keep the interval, and then I will go to the right child, and that basically refers to a leaf node that is an elementary interval, and there is also something stored there. So I will grab there, and this is my answer. Sir? For every yes. Industry. Yes. Because these are these are different endpoints. Right? There's only one endpoint. So, and this actually I need that because to, to, to define them as edge space keys. All right. So this is basically what's going on here is basically I traverse the tree, except that every node in the tree is a, is a row in my table. Okay. And the cool thing here is how many traversals I'm going to do logarithmic to the, with respect to the number of things that I put there. So that gives me a, down, a, predict, a predictable bound as to my latency. Okay, so interval queries pretty much go the same. 
Uh, I'm showing this example to illustrate something which is another characteristic of segment trees, which is now the bad side of segment trees. So again, I'm having an interval here. I'm going to my root, and I'm comparing this interval, and I see that all of this falls to the right, if I remember correctly, of the time point associated with, with the root. So once I grab uh, D for the result, I will go to the right child. Then going there, I will continue. There is nothing there to grab. So I will basically see that this interval now spans both the left and the right children. So I have to descend both down on both of them. Okay? So then I grab those, and you can basically the process follows. I have to keep track so I don't miss anything. So I collect all the data. The point here is that if I have interval queries of slightly fairly big length, depending on how my segment tree is built, I may have to descend to too many nodes in the tree. And that will help me. All right? Every descent that I do, every sound I visit is a get in edge space. That costs. Okay? So for stopping queries, it's great because I do, I don't know, 20, 30 gets, and I'm done. And I grabbed everything. All right? But when I have to grab a, a whole portion of uh, millions of nodes doing millions of gets for a particular query, this, this will kill me. And we'll, we will see that in the performance results. So now I have both indices. Okay? Which one is better? And it turns out, this was actually, didn't just turn out, it was by design after <laughs> spending some time thinking about these data structures, is that we can get uh, both of, of, of the best of both indices. What we're after here is to realize which query type is good for what query, uh, uh, which index is good for what query type. And when a query comes in, uh, send the query, route the query to the particular index. And if the query uh, is too demanding, is complex, and wants both containing and contained and, uh, and crossing, like we said, then decide which index to use for which part of that. Okay. So, th so this is what's being played out here. Okay. So basically, for an interval query AB, I do a quick scan on AB. Typically, this would be small. small I'll identify a small section of my endpoints index. And, but as we pointed out in the example earlier, I'm still missing something. So to get what I'm missing is I'm basically I'm doing a stabbing query on an MRST. And by doing the stabbing query there, I will get the missing parts. Okay, I'm guaranteed to get the missing parts. I will get some overlap, but I can filter those out every time I, uh, I visit a node. Okay? So if I am, again, I am to visualize all these intervals, then the purple intervals are the ones that I'm getting from EPI, and the green intervals are, are, are the ones that I'm getting from M MRST. Okay? Uh, so this is the idea. So the next logical question is, what happens now with, up, with updates? And this is a big problem, right? So what we're trying to do here is basically piggyback onto the basic characteristic of key-value stores that give you right throughput. Okay? Based uh, basically, in all, in all of the work and the work that I'm going to talk about later, I'm indexing a value and then I'm having things added to it. So adding things to it to associate with a particular value is just adding another column for this. Okay, I have write throughput for that. That's given to me. Okay, I don't have to worry about disk nodes being filled out or blocks or whatever. Uh, again, we'll get back to that. So what we're proposing to handle the updates? We're proposing to have this updates index. The updates index is functionally the same as an endpoints index. In other words, it's a table that I can scan in eight space. Okay? The key difference is this thing is much smaller. Okay? So everything, whenever something comes in, let me actually show this. So this is my regular endpoints index, and this is my updates index that I have. So when I have to insert a new record with row key A and intervals between 9 and 19, I will go to 9 and add a row, something here, and I will go to 19 and add, and add something there, right? This is what the, how the endpoints index was working. And I will also do the same on the updates index. Basically, the updates index is supposed to be something very small that's going to tell me I don't want to be building the, the tree. The tree building is a costly, op, a costly process. And segment trees, most of these interval structures are static. So I have to rebuild them again from scratch. So what I'm doing is I'm dumping all the updates in this small index here. And when my query comes, I will run it in parallel. So I get the old stuff plus the new stuff that's been added by doing quick scans on this small index here. So that's the basic strategy. So if I'm to delete something, I want to delete the record uh, with, with key X. So I'll go and delete it from the endpoints index, and I will basically add tombstone records for that. So when I scan my parallel 
in parallel my updates index and I see a tombstone record and I go to the tree and it gives me uh, interval x, I will use the tombstone record basically to filter that out. So that's the basic idea. So in terms of stop being query, what's going on? How do we process a, a stop being query now or an interval query now that we have this updates index? We run the query on the MRST. Why? Because it's very fast. I'm going to do a logarithmic number of gets. And at the same time, I'm, I'm scanning the UI from the beginning of the, of the UI index until A, the query time point. This is small. The scan is fast. So I'm not going to pay a lot. So, and then I'm looking to add things that I have missed from the, from the tree or things that have to be removed from the tree. And if I have an interval query, then I can run my query on the tree or I can run it on, on API or both. And again, in parallel, I go and grab what's new in the updates index. Recall the updates index is small, so it doesn't hurt performance and we've tested that. I'll show you some results. So in terms of some experiments, we have uh, crawls of these uh, domains. Uh, they're not particularly big. So we used uh, three, five, and nine node clusters in EC2. We ported all, all, of our, all, all, of, all of our code there. And in terms of the uh, algorithms that we implemented, is our algorithms for building uh, and accessing the indices for query processing, uh, the support, for the native support that HSpace provides, and we also implemented Hive running on F HDFS. We also did it on, uh, on HSpace, but that was way too slow, even slower than the one on Hive. And uh, here are some results. Uh, I mentioned that what we're building, we have this map reduced spaces when we're building these structures and we have a, a simple version and an optimized version. Uh, if we see just the unoptimized versions, uh, the takeaway message here is that we, have, we see scalable performance. As we increase the number of nodes going from two to four to eight data nodes, we see things scaling nicely. And we also see big improvements when we go to the optimized instead of the, to the unoptimized version. So these are f f fairly big improvements. And again, we see a nice scaling uh, with when, when, when we uh, throw more money into the problem and buy bigger clusters. In terms of uh, stabbing queries, uh, this is basically what's going on. This is the, the HSpace filter. This is what we get with Hive. Hive basically runs huge map reduce uh, jobs uh, behind it. Again, touching in parallel though every row in the system. Here's what we get from API only if we execute the query on API only. Here's what we get if we execute the query on, on the segment tree. And of course, if we use both, we're not going to get any improvement from this. Okay. So again, we see that for stopping queries, we get a, a factor of two or three uh, better performance from, uh, from running it on the tree. Here, uh, running one week old intersection query. So what we did is we looked into the data set and we randomly picked 100 queries, I think, uh, with uh, we, we picked 100 random one-week intervals. And because the data set is very dense, this basically is a lot of intervals in the particular data set. So immediately you see what's going on to the tree, right? This is the, the effect that I mentioned earlier, right? Going down the tree, you have to visit basically a big portion of the nodes and you have to grab huge numbers of, of, of intervals, intervals from each, each one of them. Again, API stays consistently below a certain bound. And if we do both, that is, I only do on the segment tree, I don't do the whole thing, but I only do the stopping query, and I do the remaining on API, things are, again, improved considerably. Sure. The database here? The, yeah, it, we're talking about a, a few million from, from two and a half to six million intervals. How big is each record? Uh, I don't remember, to be honest. Uh, the question is because we have different versions of this, but I think what we did was we just put onto the tables in HSpace only the, the attributes that we care about. So we don't just have all the records there from the, from the original data set. If you, are to, if you were to put that in, it would, because they will also have the text associated with this, and so it would be huge. Uh, so again, uh, pretty much, so this is the one week old. For the demos data set, again, we see the same scenario. The tree really is good performance for stabbing. If you go to uh, so here what we did for the demos, I forgot to mention, is that we created uh, synthetic queries to be, to be able to play with, a, with a sensitivity as to the selectivity of the query. So we designed queries that we knew manually were going to give us 25% uh, of, of, of the whole data set to see what's going on. And we see again uh, the trends that we have seen before. Uh, both is a clear winner if we run the query, the, the big interval query on both indices and get the best of both 
and even when running to 75% selectivity in this particular data set, uh, again, we see pretty much the same, the same behavior. Okay, so last set of experiments is when I'm basically running uh, in the face queries in the face of updates. So now the new player in the scene is the so-called index, uh, the updates index. So what we've done is we assumed that the queries, when the queries start playing, a certain percentage of what was originally in my indices are now being stored in the updates index. And this percentage was varied from 5 to 30%. So this 95% here basically means uh, that 95% uh, of, my, of, of my data is in the tree and 5% of the data is new data that's not in the tree yet and it's in the updates index. So when a query comes in, remember it goes on in parallel. It goes on the tree and it goes on to the API or it, goes, it, can go, it has to go in parallel to the updates index to get the new stuff. Okay? So the update index was, was varied up to 30% of the, of the original uh, size of the tree or of, of, of the original number of, uh, of intervals. And again, the thing to notice here is that it's, it's pretty stable. So we don't get big, any really deterioration going on in terms of time because of accessing in parallel the updates index. So this is pretty standard. Uh, we see the same behavior everywhere. This looks like differences, but they're really within the statistical uh, range. So it's not really big differences if you look at the, into the y axis. OK, so in terms of the conclusions for this part, uh, this is the first crack on doing interval queries on key-value stores. These interval queries are becoming more and more popular, basically driven from the need to do temporal analytics and all kinds of things like this. So uh, we uh, came up with a few uh, indices that can help us uh, solve the problem. We build them with MapReduce jobs. Uh, we have uh, index processing, uh, query processing algorithm utilizing these indices. We have an index maintenance scheme that does not lock out queries, and queries see the new things that are being that have been put there. And we've seen big performance in terms of uh, the native support or in terms of running MapReduce jobs. So you're, you're reporting latency, but you're not reporting cost, and you're not reporting throughput. Right. Uh, what can you say about that? Okay. So the cloud latency is a Cloud latencies tend to be rather large, and so cloud latencies are sort of high a lot. Well, you're right. Uh, for example, in the other in the other part of the work, I was uh, we explicitly also reporting bandwidth, uh, which can be an indication as to the throughput that can be achieved. Uh, here, of course, nothing else was running into our clusters, right? So the thing that was running into our cluster was just basically our, our hundred queries. So uh, I, I, I have a good feeling that if I were to report throughput, I would possibly be getting the same behavior because of this. Uh, so even if one more, if, if, even if a particular index or a particular strategy is very uh, resource hungry, it will not be showing here because there's nothing, a lot of things going on co concurrently. Uh, but if, you're right. If I were to set it up in a real cluster with a lot of things going on, something that basically wastes bandwidth around would basically my, would kill my throughput. So, but there, there, will not be, there is no serializing point like that in the performance. Okay. Um, any other questions? Yes? Um, what's the, the query, like each query, uh, like in database, we have a transaction context, right? Here, do you provide any this, uh, transaction, similar to transaction context? Okay, so this is a big, a, a big discussion. So the question is, what kind of consistency yes. uh, they're being shown here? In terms of the regular queries, is whatever the cloud gives me. Basically, what HPage gives you is like read committed consistency. Uh, so in terms of our updates, it's also easy to show that we can show read committed consistency. Okay, so that's about it. Now, there is a lot of work going on that basically trying to improvide the snapshot isolation consistency, uh, consistency semantics or even pure serializability semantics into within edge space. And that would be easy. This is part of why we did this, right? So if there's anybody underneath us in the infrastructure give us another way to define transactions and help, for example, serialize our index updates with a, with a raw data, fine for us. We just hook that. Because everything is implemented in edge based lingo. We're just using their APIs, we're doing everything. 
Okay, so the part two, uh, I think I got about 25 minutes. Okay. So part two refers to run join queries. Uh, this crowd is probably <laughs> uh, knows all, of, all about it. So this is a typical SQL template for this. Typically, we're, we're talking about an n-way join. Uh, uh, there are different models. Most models assume that one of the attributes in your table uh, is being used to define the score attribute for a particular record. Okay? And the key point is that when you're joining tuples, uh, you have to compute like an aggregated score that comes from the two uh, relations that are being joined. And this is typically a monotonic aggregation function, like summation or something like that. So we'll be using summation without loss of generality here. So the contributions here are basically two different, uh, again, techniques to do this. Uh, the first thing we're going to do, there has been some work here on decentralized, this is just an aside, there's been some work on decentralized uh, run join algorithms. The most frustrating thing when I was reading those works was the fact that they don't do the, the simplest way of doing this in a decentralized environment. There is a very stra almost straightforward way to be able to do this in a distributed environment. And all of them do very complicated sampling approaches with cute mathematics to show that the sample is correct with these uh, types of guarantees. But I bet good money that, that they would lose against the simple approach. So let me tell you what the simple approach is and what these uh, more sophisticated uh, Bloom filtered histograms, uh, which is a novel statistical structure for unknown joints that we're coming up with, what th those are all about. OK, what is the basic idea? The basic idea is I have my row data, okay? some records, some row keys. Here's my join attribute value, and here's my score, plus other things that I don't care about. Okay. So the base key here is uh, the record key, whatever that was designed to be. So I'm building an inverted score list. So this is basically this thing, but built in terms of score. So the row key here is a score. Okay. And so this is a rehash of this in an inverted score list. So the basic idea is we're building this rehash, this inverted, this is an inverted index, right? We're based on score, sort of score inverted index. So we build this using a MapReduce, and we start fetching batches of rows from this inverted index list. So I have two relations that I want to join and compute the top k join. I'm going to go to every ISL of this relation, and I start bringing in batches of rows. And uh, when I bring these batches of rows, I can perform your favorite algorithm for centrally producing a top k result, a top k join result. In this case, the Elias et al. VLDB03 algorithm, which is pretty much a standard in the area. So when I bring a new batch of rows, I will check every row there against all the rows that I've brought previously to see if there is a join. And if there is a join, I will compute the aggregated score for the join. And then I will check to see if there is a chance that any other records that I have not brought yet can make it into the uh, top k result. Okay? And if so, I will continue to fetching batches. If not, I will stop. All right? This is the, basically this, the ala Fagin threshold algorithm applied there for, for the, the traditional top k query. What needs to be true in order for you to be able to stop early? What needs to be true about the aggregated? Uh... It has to be monotonic. Right. Uh, you're right, I wrote that, but I did not mention that. Right. Uh, so here is a typical example of how, of how this works. I'm assuming here that the batches are just, I'm bringing a row at a time. So I'm going now, uh, I'm bringing the first row, so I'm looking into the join attribute values. There is no match there, so I'm going and bring the second row. And I'm going to try to match this with those, both of these rows there. I'm seeing a result on value 17. There is a join. So I compute the score by just adding the different scores there. So that, that's one so, uh, uh, result. Then I'm also going to join this one with the, with the first two from the other relation. And I'm seeing a join on, on, on attribute value 12. And I'm also aggregating the scores there. So this one is obviously the, the highest one. So this is my top k, my current top one uh, join result. And if we look closely, we'll see that nobody else that I can bring from, from this row and down can have a score that's higher than 183. That's why I stop. This is the threshold criteria. So this is pretty simple stuff. And we'll see that it's working very nicely. And you can do this in any distributed system, even on DHT, that I've seen peer-to-peer -peer solutions for this. It's really easy to do. 
Like you use what other people have done for the centralized processing, you bring it in with batches, and it works. So the bad thing with the previous algorithm is that you bring in tuples, and you don't even know if they're going to join. Right? So depending on the distributions of the scores and the join attribute values, this may really kill you. Okay? So the goal is try to bring in more on only those tuples for which you have a pretty good guarantee that they're going to be in the join result. And here's where our statistical structures come into play. We're using histograms where the buckets of the histograms reflect score ranges. Okay? And what we're going to be putting into the, those histograms are join attribute values. All of that will become more clear in a minute. And I don't want to just keep the frequency of the histogram, because then I have to make assumptions about the distribution of the joint attribute values within the score range. And I don't want to do that, because in practice, those do not, do not work very nicely. So what I'm going to do is I want to keep every single attribute value that went into a particular Bloom filter. Sorry, that went into a particular bucket. Okay? But because this can be huge, I'm going to use a Bloom filter to summarize this data. So here's what the structure looks like. I'm having two relations here. I'm showing only the join attribute value and the, and the score value. So if I were to build a Bloom filter histogram matrix, as we call it for R1, what are we doing? We're processing every, every uh, row at a time. So we see that the join value is A, the join attribute value is A, and the score is 1. So I'm having a bucket for every score range every tenth of the score. Say scores are normalized in this case. Okay? So this here is a Bloom filter representing the contents of the bucket. So I'm going to hash A. It's going to give me to this position in the bit, in, in the Bloom filter, and set that bit. In this case, in this particular example, I'm using counting Bloom filters to simplify it. So again, here I'm going to hash C. I'm seeing from the score that it refers to the first bucket, so I'm going to go to this Bloom filter and set the bit that uh, corresponds to the hash of C. Okay? So I keep doing that for all of these. Here, 0.82 falls to the second hash packet. So if I hash B, I go here and I set this bit into the second Bloom filter. So this is the basic idea. So I keep doing this. I thought I had skipped that animation. So please bear with me for a minute. Ah. Okay. So uh, and I've also built similarly, similarly the equivalent buckets using Bloom filters for the other relation. Now, what's going to be going on during query processing is I'm going to be fetching the bucket at a time, starting from the high-end buckets. So first I'm going to fetch the bucket that refers to the, uh, everything that has a score between 0 0.9 and 1, from this relation and from this relation. Now look into those Bloom filters. If I just do a bitwise AND, I know there's a join. Here there is no join. I have something that has is here, something that has is here, something that has is here. Okay. No. So I don't have to build anything. I don't have to bring anything. Now, when I go and build this bucket here, I will compare it with the content of this and do a bitwise AND again. And I will see that here, in this position, I have two tuples of, of the second relation that had a value that has into this position for the join attribute, and one tuple from the first relationship that had uh, a tuple with join attribute that has into the here. So I have a join result there. Actually, I have two join results. Because I have two tuples from this one with, with, with has value B in this, in this case, and one tuple from that one with has value B. Okay. So I have a join result because B is the join attribute value, right? And I had a tuple from here with a join attribute value B, and two tuples from here for the join attribute value B. Because these are blue filters, right? So I Right. I have I have a counting blue filter. Okay, but you're right, there are four positives. So it could be a bit more, so it's two point zero two or something. But I'm always on the safe side. I may be bring something more, but I'm not gonna miss anything because of the false positives. But so let's forget the false positives because it's actually it's a big discussion here. So here I have a structure that can tell me when I have a join result. What I need now is I can also associate with these two join results a high score and a low score, the high, using basically the score range for, from the buckets. And I use those for my threshold criteria to decide if I need to bring more buckets. Okay? So this is how it works. And uh, so the idea is we create a Bloom filter 
for each one of the, of the score ranges that we care about. And we store it as one column in a row. This is a blob of bits. Actually, it's a big discussion here if you're going to have counting Bloom filters, if you're going to have plain Bloom filters, how many hash functions you're going to use, and what kind of compression algorithm with, which you use here. So we've done, believe me, a lot of work here. And we've did, we're actually going with plain Bloom filters with Golomb compressed, uh, which are, and we use a Golomb compressed set representation of them. I don't know many details. It's my colleague Nikos that actually found all of this. <laughs> I designed the structures in the algorithm. <laughs> so uh, the other idea then is we need a reverse mapping. Let me just explain what that is. So here, here I have my relation. So I'm passing these values and I'm putting them into my Bloom filter and here are different positions. So into position seven, I had D hashes into position seven, for example, right? And I'm keeping a track that I have two things that hash into here. But I also maintain what we call the reverse mapping. In other words, when the person who, the node, the querying node that collects these Bloom filters sees that at position K, I have a join result, there has to be a mechanism that you can go back and say, give me whatever has into position K. So here, basically, I have a table where the keys are the, the, the position indices, the non-zero position indices of my Bloom filter. So if somebody comes to this guy and says, give me whatever has to position 100 to your Bloom filter, because I have a match, he can go here and grab all the relevant tuple information, such as uh, the tuple ID, the joint attribute value, and the exact score. OK? Again, this is a nice table on eight space. I can do quick gets, multi gets, and all of that. So the algorithm works like this. We fetch a bucket uh, from each of the tables, starting from the high end of the, uh, of the range. We compute basically an AND of all the different Bloom filters. And we use the scores to figure out whether we need applying the threshold algorithm to keep bringing more uh, buckets in. If so, we repeat the process, else we stop. So the join here, there is no join yet. We basically do a bitwise on and a bitwise AND. And we see whether or not we have enough results for the join. And when we have enough results for the join, we go back to the table and say, give me all the tuples, the tuple IDs that ha uh, has into position 100, like I was saying earlier. OK? So again, for the data, uh, for, the, for the performance, we took uh, from the TPCH uh, two relations, uh, the line item and the parts relation. And we also created a synthetic one for reasons that I will explain uh, shortly. Uh, we have pretty much the same setup. And we're doing top K joins where K is 10 up to 10,000. Uh, we also have high volume map reduce and implement, implemented. Too slow, I'm not even going to bother show it. And, uh, the, this simple idea with the inverted score list, a run join algorithm, use batches referring to 1%, 5%, and 10% of the complete score mass. Okay. So here, what the results look like. Uh, the green bars refer to the Bloom filtered uh, histograms approach. And here we see that the simple idea, the ISL idea, works nicely. In the sense that at least there is always one configuration, in this case, the 1% score mass configuration that always beats in terms of query times the, the Bloom filter histogram. Okay? In terms of bandwidth, though, and here's back to, to the point that you made earlier, uh, in terms of bandwidth, this is uh, not the case. The compression, because Bloom filters are summary sets, anyway, we see that uh, from 10 to 30 times better improvement. And so this would tell me something about throughput, and it would definitely tell me something about cost that you also brought up, David. Because most of the charge models now charge you for whatever, whatever operations you're doing. Uh, so if, if I'm doing, like, for example, the new DynamoDB charge model, if I'm doing an operation, I'm buying base, I'm provisioning for a specific read capacity, read throughput capacity, as they call it. So for every read of one kilobyte that I do, I pay. Okay? So the more kilobytes that you have to read in order to answer the query, this translates into bucks. So both in this, in this, it's not exactly what you talked about in terms of throughput and exact dollar values, but it gives some indication towards that. So, so isn't this kind of an algorithm, would, why wouldn't this kind of an algorithm work simply in a sort of a normal uh, cluster-based uh, distributed uh, database system? I think that it would. I think the, the, this particular uh, statistical structure would work, yes. It just happened that the, the environment that we looked at was cloud values, queues, uh, key value stores. But I think they would look in regular uh, uh, SQL databases. 
so now an interesting thing is looking at the score distributions is actually the different scores and how many uh, tuples from the original relations fell there. So the reason why the simple idea beat the Bloom filter histograms was that because it could stop somewhere around there and it did, it did not bring a lot of stuff before it stopped. So that's why it stopped. So what we did is basically we reversed. We flipped this around. This is the synthetic uh, part of the relation. And indeed, we see that this guy is always better even in time. And in terms of bandwidth, we saw even a, a big up, up to 50 times savings. Uh, so conclusions, the first crack on, on, on rank joints or key value stores. We think, as, as David pointed out, that these statistical structures can be used uh, in, other, in other environments as well. Uh, the reason why we particularly like this is the ISL is a simple idea. Everybody is comfortable in CS with built inverted uh, indices, and uh, it seems to be doing a good job. There are some configuration issues, such as how much to bring at every, with every batch, but again, this is, there is no system that doesn't have this uh, tuning parameter problem. Uh, with respect to the Bloom filter histogram matrix, we have great bandwidth savings, which translate into cost, and the query times vary depending on or, or, or whether bringing in the huge filters will actually pay off. So if the distributions are charged that you really have to go deep, you may have to bring the whole uh, filter and that may actually not pay off. So actually we, we're looking into f to find really bad uh, distributions and negative correlations between the joint attribute value and the scores in order to see uh, when this will not be better compared to the, to, to the baseline approach. So the third part of the talk, for about five, six minutes, that I still have, uh, I, I want to basically go through a number of things that are beyond the traditional conclusions that one sees in, 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 in this type of, of research. Things that we've learned working with key value stores and trying to build the indices for them. So what we're doing is we're having a key value representation of indices. Basically that means we, whatever it is, we put it into tables. Everything for us, every index is an H-based table and we use the API provided by HBase or whatever, whatever key value store to get that. So what does an index need, especially for a, for a key value environment, for these types of applications? You need fast column additions and deletes. You have a value, and then you have something else that has this value, and something else that has this value, and something else that has this value. This is easily done by HBase, right? Or most key value stores. You can easily add columns. And you need key accesses, either for exact match, simple get operations, or multi-get operations, or for scans. And again, all of these are actually optimized. Key value stores were, were exist for these types of workloads. So they're great for building your indices. And this is actually a big departure from related work. Most of the related work don't bother building indices, as I said, because what they're doing is that they line them up to do jobs to do joins with different optimizations. Or when they try to build some index, there, is, there has been a couple of works, they basically are too low to the block level of the disk. Okay? And then you have problems with updates or complete indexes disappearing, or if you want to delete an index, how do you delete an index? Okay? You, you're left with big holes in your, in your actual physical storage of the, of the data. Isn't, isn't the knock about index building indexes that, that you, it's so costly to build the indexes at the start that you really have a hard time advertising that cost over the range? You're right, this is a classical problem. I mean, should I build an index for this or should I not build an index for this? Uh, uh, one of the things that we're looking at is that for some, like if you are to run a map reduce job, it's so long that it will actually be faster to build the index first and just use it for that query. But I do not have any hard numbers on this. But it would definitely be the case. I mean, you, could, you can easily imagine this huge, long running map reduce jobs, right? So build the index for 20 minutes or 30 minutes or an hour, and then run your query, which will take uh, a, a few seconds. It will still be better than 15 hours of the running with the MapReduce job. So that's one possible answer. Is, but the idea of what we really need here, and, I, and I'm trying to get to that later, is some kind of an optimizer, right? Should I build the index? And when I, if I build it, should I use it or not? And, and I'll get to that in a, in a later point. So this other thing that is actually um, closer to my heart now is, uh, uh, there, is there was this old divide between main memory and disk indices. So there is a lot of smart people that work in computational geometry problems, for example, like CS theorists. 
and they've come up with these really nice, cute data structures. The database community never looked into those because they said, ah, they're for main memory applications. Some of the main, when the main memory databases back in the 90s got a big lift, some people started looking into them. Uh, but there was this whole divide, okay? So my idea is, uh, if you're using key value representations of this, most of these problems go away. There is no divide there anymore. Why? Because my index pointer, it just points to a row. And this row can have as many columns as you want, representing the values that fit this particular row. So I don't have to worry about node splits and, and, and merging and, and uh, uh, fill factors for my, for my block on disk, any of that. HBase takes care of that. And it does a good job in taking care of that. So. So, so wouldn't that have some, the details have some impact on your potential performance or are you arguing that everything is washed out given the you know, cloud latencies? Partly, but uh, okay. So the potential performance is what? The potential performance is when I add stuff, I add columns. This is really done fast because key value stores do this. And when I retrieve stuff, I just do get on columns, which again, there are physical indices there that can do this really fast or do scans. So I'm not really paying a lot. So the whole point of, of building this index is to do surgically go and access specific rows or do uh, segments of rows together using scans. And the key value stores are fast for these things. I have trouble fully buying what you're saying because if that were, if that were true, then that, that would seem to be to apply to normal database systems as well. No, because there, you see, if I have a table, I cannot just add columns to the table. It's a different data model. See, here I can just add columns. So if I'm building the inverted list, and okay, so I want to find out which items uh, the, the attribute value A is associated with which items. As new items come in, I just add new columns for that in my key value store. This is really fast, just the main memory access. And when I get, I just go and get this value, and I will get all of those rows, or all of these new columns that have been added. I cannot do the same with, with SQL tables. So this is the new, uh, and this way I think is an interesting, is something interesting that, that comes out of this. That I can make divides like that go away. And, and the point is that there's a lot of smart people out there, like I said, that have really come up with this, but they're, they're dismissed by the database community as being uh, uh, old school or only main memory. Uh, uh, so we can use these structures, and actually, we, in other words, that we're doing, we are using some of these structures for massive data sets as well. Not in the normal database sense, but at least on tables on key value stores. Now, on big data indices and MapReduce. Now, MapReduce will trump your index if you have high query selectivities. In other words, if the result is a big portion of your data anyways. Okay, and they will do it parallelously. And if you're careful about how you do it, so there is not of copying and reading back between the mappers and the reducers and all of that, uh, MapReduce will be a winner there. So the speak is, uh, remember the cute title in the beginning, no MapReduce for no SQL queries? Well, it's actually, we're talking mostly about complementing MapReduce. And in fact, our goal is, uh, and we will welcome to tackle this problem together with any of you that are interested, to, to, look, to work towards an optimizer. So I have a new query that comes in. What kind of statistics do I need and how do I decide whether I should run a MapReduce job or I just use one of the syntheses? Or perhaps just build the index first, as we were saying earlier, and run the query on that. And we need cost models for that, which is not an easy thing to do, to the extent that these things change a lot. Okay. Uh, but there's also throughput costs because MapReduce may win with respect to response time because you have this massive, this embarrassing parallelizable mappers and reducers going on uh, 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 across thousands of, of machines. So they might actually do a very good job in, in, uh, in response time, but it might hurt your pocket. Again, if the charge model charges for whatever you read and if you have to touch on every single record in the data store, you're going to have to pay for it. So your win here might actually hurt your pocket. Okay, so another thing is that key value stores are read challenged, and that really means two things. One thing is that they're not read optimized. They were basically write optimized. They were designed for write intensive applications for extremely high write throughput. 
this means, as I said, two things. The first thing is we need the indices to do that. If we're gonna, if we talk about queries, okay, and we're gonna ask something that's read challenged, as I call it, then you better have indices to go and get it fast. The other thing is that you, we're putting with works like this the, the key value stores. We're stressing them to the indexing task, in the sense that we do a lot of gets, and gets are not the reads, right? This is how you read from a key value store, and those are not optimized. So. Using trees, for example, with logarithmic depths might help you, especially with respect to the predictability. I will do 30 gets to go down from the root to the leaf for a billion nodes, for a billion uh, uh, size data set. But still, if we having talk about interval queries like we saw in the segment tree representation in the key value store, we still have to do visit a big number of the nodes doing get for each one of them, and that would still hurt performance. So I think there is money to be made research-wise looking at alternative key, key value representations where you basically store your trees or whatever in a way that you can get at them quickly with scan operations. So how you play around, how you define your key so that they will be stored physically together and quick scans over them will give you the results without having to do explicit gets sequentially. Okay. So I've got a store. Uh, thank you for, for inviting me, and I'll be glad to answer any more questions you may have. Questions? No more. All right. So I just had one, which is, which is the, the, the segment index. Um, so, so I assume you, one, one, one advantage of the segment index is that you can map it into the ordinary uh, indexes that you see inside key value stores. Mm -hmm. Yes. I could do the same with the interval tree. But with the, uh, yeah, interval trees. Uh, those are similar because it's, they still have the same uh, atomic el or elementary, uh, end uh, elementary intervals. Uh, we just chose segment trees for reasons that have to do with efficiency, even though there are more stores that are hungry than, than interval trees. And uh, there's other things, right? Here I'm talking about what's being indexed here uh, in, in that work is a one-dimensional object, an interval. So if, I, like, you've done work, for example, where you, you, know, you build, we have uh, the interval and something else. So you combine, like, a B tree on a kid or some, att or some attribute, and you want to have uh, on, uh, uh, an, an interval associated with that as well. So it would be interesting to see how that would map into, into, key, into a key value representation as well. Consider uh, indexing both start and endpoints and doing intersections to find results. Well, this is the endpoints index is close to that. So for every interval, basically, I'm, I'm having a row that's a start and, and, and another row for the endpoint. So it's it's very close to that. And uh, this is uh, similar, like back in the temporal databases where they were in their height. Uh, there were like uh, notions like the, the, the time index, I think one of them was called. Uh, so basically, the idea was the same. It created the, the different endpoints, but then, then you would build something like a B plus tree over that. Here, I don't have to do that. Because in essence, if I have this endpoints index, HBase does binary search on, the, on this. So it's like I have a binary tree over my endpoints. So I'm getting that for free. So. Uh, yeah, there are very similar ideas that have been played around for some time. And this is a very deep field because just going into the historical uh, database or the temporal databases with both validity time and transaction times, humongous uh, literature there. But all of them come down to the same thing, to similar things, rather. I'm not familiar with uh, the actual implementation of HBase, so I was wondering why did you claim that they are read challenge? What cost you? Well, all of them, all of these key value stores, they're optimized for writes. What does that mean? That means that when a write comes in, it's just written in a memcache somewhere. Periodically, when this thing's filled out, what's happening is it's sorted out and it's put into uh, something to be written into a block ready to be written to disk with an additional index per row here. So uh, as you're having updates coming in all the time, you're having different of these, the so-called H files, and this can be sent to disk everywhere. So when a get comes in, you may just have to just get all of these H files to figure out which is the recent get. 
there is a value to get. You're saying that uh, they're actually, it's a log, so they're using log structure uh, techniques. In essence, the, right, the log structured file system, for example, is, is something that actually permeates all of this design philosophy here. But I mean, HBase is, HBase is based on Bigtable, which uses log structured merge trees. So those, those partition files should be merged back together. Periodically. Eventually. Eventually. So it's only if you're reading stuff that's been recently written that you have this fragmentation problem where you've got to pull stuff from the recent log as well as from the older ones. You don't always have the problem. Okay, so the idea is the actual implementation is, is they, have, they use Bloom filters. So you're asking for a particular row key. So they use Bloom filters to decide which of the different H files that you have created, which are the blobs of data that's written to disk, actually have this row in them. Okay? And if they have not been compacted, this H file, so to one big H file, Okay, if it's, if it's compacted, you just grab the index of that and you go and get the row. If it's not be compacted, you have to bring this. So then you have tuning decisions on how fast to do the big compaction versus the short compaction and so on and, th and so forth. And eventually you get hiccups when you do a lot of reads over this. So you see a good performance and then all of a sudden you get boom. And what's happening? <laughs> In the background, it's basically trying to reconcile things. So yep. once it's reconciled, everything is faster. Yes. Do you have control over that in HBase, or is it just? I think you do. I think, but I'm uh, like I wouldn't bet my money on it. It's a configuration parameter. It's a big, yeah. big parameter. And you can specify how frequently that compaction. But you don't know. That's the point. I mean, having control something that you don't know. How how the heck would you know what what the right time is? This is classical problem for most systems, right? We have all these parameters and we don't know how to tune them. So edge space falls in that category. That's why I called it fit silenced. The problem was too hard to solve, so we give you a parameter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and if you fine tune it, I, I have algorithms that will show you, but I'm doing great. Yeah. Yes. You talked about the uh, update index uh, as part of your uh, talk. So uh, did you perform any experiments on like, uh, what is the scalability? Like how, what kind of update rates you can handle? No. This is actually in the list to do. It makes absolute sense. Uh, but this is basically riding on what HBase can give you, okay? But it makes perfect sense to be able to know that. And one of the things why we're actually doing this, in other words, staying at a high level, is because there's a lot of work going on here. And it could be that in three months from now, if I run the same experiment that you mentioned, we'll get different results. Because it's a huge community, all this community is contributing stuff, and there's a lot of smart people working here. All right. Thank the speaker and I think we're done. Thank you.